All right, good morning. good morning. And I am remembering to say, if you are watching us on live stream, welcome. We're glad you're here with us, too. Uh, our sanctuary has expanded. Who knew? Uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, talk about your radiant self. In particular, I want to talk about Jacob in the Old Testament. And what I mean by your radiant self uh, is your best self, your God self. We might call it your Christ self. Um, I was traveling recently uh, for a few days. Uh, it's very interesting to travel and um, try to be conscious in the process. You know what I mean? Uh, so, of course, uh, to practice the presence at the airport, I think, is really high spiritual practice. I do. I do. So I happen to be one of those people, um, and this must be my consciousness, and um, I am one of those people who is frequently chosen for the big search. Uh, you know, everything out of my carry-on, shoes off, pockets empty, pat down, pat up, pat front, pat back, pat it all. Um, and you know, it was amazing because it was all okay with me. Uh, I was at the airport a couple hours early, like they suggest. I had time and I could smile and really appreciate that the TSA person was making it safe for us to travel. I felt pretty good so far. As I was gathering up the contents of my carry-on, my shoes, getting back my phone, my wallet, my keys, my comb, my belt, my glasses, my sunglasses, and on and on and on. So this takes time. This takes time. I'm getting all this stuff together, and a woman comes rushing through that first screening detector archway thing, and she sets off the alarm. And so the security fellow asks her to step back through, please. And she gave a big huff. You know the huff I'm talking about. That huff that's a big nonverbal communication of I'm really displeased with you. How dare you inconvenience me. And she walked through again. And the alarm goes off again. And she blurts out, I'm in a hurry, like nobody else at the airport is. I have a plane to catch, like the rest of us are going water skiing, you know? <laughs> My observation was this was not her most radiant self, you know? In fact, we were beginning to see the tip of the iceberg of her not radiant self. Now, just as a word of encouragement to those who may travel in the future, Getting huffy with security is not the best choice on the menu. Yeah, it's not. You are not going to get what you want if you get huffy with security. So she's invited to step into what I think of as the big search, you know? And she does not want to play. She does not want to play. You know how it is? And, she's, and they say, we have to uh, go through your bag. And she says, in absolute seriousness, and this was amazing to me because I think I have felt the exact same way. She says, you're making me late. Now, blame is not a good tactic to take, you know. She doesn't want to, uh, the girl to, uh, to go in her bag, but the girl is on purpose, this woman, and she gets the supervisor, and together, they go through the bag, and all the while, the woman is very irate, saying, I'm in a hurry, and you are making me late, and you're going to make me miss my plane. Interesting to notice that she accepts no responsibility for the fact that she was supposed to be at the airport two hours ago. And for whatever reason, and I'm sure she had fabulous reasons, you know, maybe she was getting a manicure, or her hair done, or her dog threw up all over the carpet. I don't know. But the guideline is two hours early for a domestic flight, Three hours for international. Is that still the thing? I think it is. I think it is. So she's, um, I'm in a hurry. I have a plane to catch. You're making me light. Making me late. Now, the supervisor is very clear. And he's very, very centered. He says, I'm sorry you were late. Yeah. Hmm? But they're going to go through her bag. All of her bag. I mean, every little thing. <laughs> Every little thing. See, this is what happens when you're snarky with people, you know, and they have a little power and dominion and authority, and they're just doing their job. And so she found, um, oh, they found uh, a pair of scissors, okay, which, scissors, you know, 
you can't have these. And so, you know, they shake their head and take them away, and they go into a bin or something like that. And she's mad. She's mad. She is fit to fight bear with a stick. She is. You know, and so she throw, she's throwing her stuff in the bag, kind of like a little kid when you make them clean up their room and they don't want to. You know, she is just having a hissy fit and a half is what she's having. She's angry and she's victimized and she runs for the gate, cursing the whole way, cursing the whole way. Now, life is not working well for the less than radiant self. All right, does that really make sense? You know, when we show up as less than our radiant self, our best self, our God self, our Christ self, things do not work too well. I get it, it's hard to be your radiant self under duress. You know, because under duress, we regress. Under stress, we tend to regress. But I believe everyone has the greatness of God within them, whether we're calling it forth in the moment or not. It doesn't mean that it's not there. We can all do great things. We can all do things that have huge rippling effects and change the world for better. I believe that that's so. We can show up as more of our best self. So I truly believe every single person is important to God. Otherwise, you would not be here. And you are important to God because God knows your best self. And I believe that that's what God, by means of us, wants to see expressed in the world. So I saw a sign, um, uh, going back uh, around the time of the Olympics, that says, you don't win the silver, you lose the gold. And I thought, well, that's one way to look at it. Um, you know, because to me that was kind of harsh. Um, and uh, in seeing this, uh, this uh, I think it was an ad, uh, you know, thank you for the five-color reminder of that nasty doubt that says, you don't measure up, you're not enough. Now, I don't want to live in the world of universal doubt. That's what I call it. The universal doubt is a belief that there is not enough or I'm not enough, there's not enough for me, not enough love, not enough money, not enough people, not enough opportunity. It's just that general uh, belief of not enoughness. Now, I want to live in faith in spirit, where love and compassion are the heroes rather than competition, you know, and comparison. In God, there are lots and lots and lots of winners. Yeah. In God, your radiant self gets to shine. People, people restrain from taking the low road. And you hear me say all the time, the reason the low road is the low road is because very little effort will take you there. All right? We help and share with our neighbor. We call forth the best in ourselves. We believe in the best in other people. We listen to the voice of God within. We listen with a loving heart to other people. I talked with a college teacher of mine a little while back, and, um, and we hadn't spoken in, in, oh, I don't know, over a decade. And he reminded me that many people get through college thinking that they're going to be the ones to set the world on fire and put um, most of their time, they're going to set the world on fire, but then what they do is they put most of their time and energy into getting and spending, right? At, uh, at least at first, right? Now, I think that's out of balance, and out of balance does not support the expression of the best that is within us, you know? Um, out of the, the stuff that we think of as the bad stuff, our, our God self doesn't really shine. Um, so I had read this. I thought this was really an interesting. In 1923, this really important meeting was held at the Edgewater uh, Beach Hotel in Chicago. And attending the meeting were eight of the world's most successful financiers. And so um, the president of uh, a largest independent steel company, the president of the largest gas company, the greatest wheat speculator, president of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, on and on and on. President of the, ca uh, uh, a member of the president's cabinet, uh, the greatest bear in all of Wall Street, head of the world's greatest monopoly, and the president of the Bank of the International Settlements. Okay, so these are big movers and shakers at the time in 1923. So certainly, we have to admit that uh, here are gathered a group of the world's very, very, very successful people uh, at least they had found the secret of making money, right? 25 years later, though, here is where these men were, right? 
Uh, the president of the largest independent steel company, uh, Charles Schwab, died bankrupt and lived on borrowed money uh, for five years before his death. Okay. President of the largest uh, company, Howard Hobson, went insane. The greatest wheat speculator, Arthur Cotton, mm, died abroad insolvent. President of the New York Stock Exchange uh, had just been released from Sing Sing prison. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, the president's cabinet member was pardoned uh, from prison so he could die at home. And on and on and on. It was, not, it was not good. So all of these men learned well the art of making money, but not one of them had learned how to live. You know, in our time now, we're beginning to see similarities um, to these past performances, it seems to me. Uh, so what happens, you know, if we don't get the lesson is we repeat the lesson. So I think we want to feel successful and um, like we're doing our, our purpose. We want to feel important. We want to think of ourselves as good people, deserving the approval and the respect of other good people, don't we? Yes, absolutely. We want to know we matter to the world, and the world takes us seriously. It would be a shame to feel like um, we had not done anything worthwhile with our time here on Earth. So if we go for consciousness, and, which is an awareness of our oneness with God, a belief that we are connected with all of life, with spirit, um, if we go for God first, everything else will be added. Because it says in the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom, and everything else with added, will be added. So for us as students of mind, one way, as a science of mind, one way for us to approach this is to say, I will pursue, I will focus on my relationship with the presence of God within. I will work on my relationship with this principal power and presence of spirit. And then, out of that, everything else will take place. You know, and so we let that, that relationship we have with spirit within direct and guide us to be the best person we can be. Now, in the book of Genesis is the story of Jacob. Now, I like the story of Jacob. Jacob is a really interesting character because J Jacob goes in his lifetime from being a trickster to being Israel, the one who struggles with God. So it's very um, intriguing. You know, we know more about Jacob than anyone else in the Bible. Yeah, we see him as a child, we see him as a young man, we see him as a father, as a husband, as an old man. Uh, we see him interact with his parents, with his brother, with his wives, with his father-in-law, children, grandchildren, and the God of his ancestors. So he's a big player. He's a big, big player. And so we look to the Bible as a repository of wisdom. Think of it that way. The Bible is a repository of wisdom about what it means to live in the presence of God. Okay? So the story of Jacob, I think, has a lot to teach us. And for me, when I think about a Bible story, it always helps me see and visualize the story if I cast the characters. And so today, I want to say that Jacob is Zac Efron. Okay? So everybody knows Zac Efron? So we'll say that Z Jacob is a Zac Efron kind of character. He's a, you know, he's a young guy. Um, and so this story actually starts with his grandfather, Abraham who comes to the revolutionary conclusion that behind everything stands one single God. Not many gods, as other people have been practicing, and that this God demands righteous behavior of human beings. So the idea of one God really gets started by Abraham. Hmm? So Abraham and his wife Sarah pass this belief to Isaac, their only child, in common, uh, 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 and his wife Rebekah. Now, Isaac and Rebecca have twin sons. Now, when I was a kid, I really loved this story. I remember my great aunt telling me this story. I thought it was particularly interesting because I had a brother, and sometimes I wondered which brother I was in the story. Uh, but most of the time, I knew. Most of the time, I knew. Uh, so Isaac and Rebecca have twin sons, and they're born after a difficult pregnancy in which Rebecca felt the two babies struggling with each other inside of her. So Esau, the eldest, was coarse, you know, a physical brute of a man, a hunter. And Jacob was born holding on to his brother's heel. You know, uh, the J Jacob, uh, often thought of as the tripper upper or the trickster, he was quieter. So they were opposites. They had very different traits. Esau was the father's favorite. Jacob was the mother's favorite. And one day Esau comes home from an unsuccessful hunt and finds Jacob cooking lentil stew. Yeah, beans, great. Esau is desperately hungry 
and ask Jacob for stew. Jacob trades the stew for Esau's birthright. Isn't that fascinating? Can you imagine being so hungry that you would trade away your birthright? Now, the birthright is the father will give everything to the son who has the birthright. So Jacob will be considered the firstborn son now and receive the greatest portion of the father's estate after his death. So Esau is defined by appetites, right? He's willing to sell the farm just for a bowl of soup, right? So he lives for the moment. He's not concerned about tomorrow. What good is a birthright, he says, if I die of hunger today? Now, Jacob, at this point in the story, is a schemer. He is a manipulator. He will get by cleverness what he cannot get by birth or by strength. Mm. And the story continues. So the father, Isaac, is old and blind, and he's ready to do the blessing. He's ready to bestow the patriarchal blessing on his favored son, Esau. And so the implication is that Isaac's blindness is physical and spiritual. Okay. Oh, so Isaac. Let's say Isaac is Russell Crowe. Okay? Russell Crowe is Isaac. He's the older, blind, uh, physically and spiritually blind father. He can't see Jacob. You know, for all his limitations, is uh, Jacob is actually more qualified, and he can't see it. And so Rebecca, the mother, though, sees all of this very clearly. And she devises an elaborate scheme to make sure that her choice, the right brother, is blessed. And what she does is she dresses Jacob in Esau's clothes. Because right? remember, the father's blind. Russell Crowe is blind. And so she covers him in Esau's clothes and um, covers his hairless arms with goat skin so he'll feel and smell like Esau. In other words, she's saying, you need to smell like a goat because your brother smells like a goat. Okay? And she sends him to the father to be blessed before Esau gets back from the field. And so Jacob tricks his father into blessing him. Now, Jacob's soul is, is really split. There is this inner conflict between his desire to get what he wants. We all understand that, right? Because I don't know about you, but I know me. And when I want something, I want what I want. I really do. That's, that's me. And, and the sense that he can get it only by doing something deceitful and disliking himself for it. Oh, boy, the rock and the hard place. There it is. I want what I want, but to do it, I'm going to have to show up as a lot less than my best self. So he gains a spiritual blessing by a devious method. So once the blessing is given, it cannot be withdrawn. So furious, furious, the brother shows up, and the father's already given Jacob the blessing. Right? So he's furious that Esau, uh, uh, and Esau threatens to kill Jacob. And so the mother suggests that maybe he should go out of town for a while. This would be a really good time for a little road trip. Uh, why don't you go see your uncle Laban? Uh, his, that's the mother's brother, uh, and on his first night away from home, he's, remember, he's a young guy, he's ashamed of what he's done, and he goes to sleep, and he has this dream, right, because we've all heard about Jacob's dream, and he dreams of a ladder reaching from heaven down to earth, and then at the top, he senses God, who assures him his life will turn out well, and that one day, he will return home safely and go on to be a special person and do great things. So early on, there's, there's, there's not a lot about Jacob that's really likable, you know? Uh, but he grows. He grows in consciousness. He is somebody who goes from a very unconscious state to becoming someone who really, really is evolved in spiritual consciousness, right? So he goes from lower consciousness to higher consciousness. He becomes a more complete person. Now, Jacob is reassured by his dream and he prays to God, uh, promise uh, uh, that, and, and in this, God will watch over him and bring him home safely. And what he will do, this is one of the early covenants in the Bible, is that he will tithe 10% of all he earns to God. Now, he's at the well one day, and that's at the entrance to Laban's town, and Jacob meets his cousin Rachel, falls in love with Rachel. Jacob is the first person in the Bible to be described as falling in love with a woman and wanting to marry her. I just think that's an interesting thing because up until that point, marriages were pretty much arranged. Right? So previous references are to also to men taking wives. Right? So Jacob can't 
uh, pay the bride price, right, that her family expects. And so Jacob offers to work seven years for Uncle Laban at, at no wages to earn Rachel's hand in marriage. Right? And so on the wedding night, after much drinking, Laban substitutes his older daughter, Leah, for Rachel, the old switcheroony. Yes, it was popular in the Old Testament. Laban says, I understand that there are some places where the younger child rushes ahead of the older, but we would never let that happen here. That's it, right? So Jacob, who has actually successfully fooled his own father, is now been tricked by Laban, his uncle, and he has no comeback. And so uh, he has now learned what it feels like to be the victim of a clever man's thinking, right, and trickery and now understands why it's wrong to lie and cheat. So there's been some good growth in consciousness here. And this is such a great example of karma, because Jacob deceived his father, and Laban deceives Jacob. So what you put out there is coming back. Probably not from where you think, but the universe is always trying to balance the accounts. So it's coming back. So what kind of life can a person have in a world where he can't trust anyone? So Jacob is permitted to marry Rachel after promising another seven years of labor. Jacob starts home with his family. They cross the river. Uh, he doesn't actually cross the liver, river, though. He's left alone on his side of the river, and this mysterious night figure attacks him and struggles with him until daybreak. In some translations, it says that Jacob wrestles with an angel. And he says to the angel, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so Jacob is alone. And the attacker is exactly as strong as Jacob. And this is a really interesting point. Because some people say that what Jacob's really doing is that he's wrestling with himself. He's wrestling with his own consciousness, his own conscience. Right? The part of him uh, that summons him to rise above his bad impulses. So... I think about this struggle, and I think, okay, this struggle that he's having in the dream where he's wrestling with the angel is between the part of him that wins by cleverness and fraud and manipulation and that part of him that feels summoned by God to climb a ladder to heaven, to become someone exemplary, his most radiant self. So Jacob really is at war with himself at this point in the story. And I think we've all been in that place where we're like, I don't know, do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I dedicate my life to this? Do I dedicate my life to that? Is this enough or is this really what's right? So tomorrow he'll see Esau for the first time in 20 years. So he's going to see his brother for the first time in 20 years. And so Esau's parting words to him 20 years ago was, the next time I see you, I'll kill you because of what you did to me. So I don't want to meet Esau but I also don't want to keep trying to solve my problems by being deceptive. This is what we're learning here, right? So he loves Rachel. He's not so hot on Leah uh, because she is a reminder of how he was tricked, a reminder of how he tricked his own father into blessing him. And she's a reminder of that part of him that's not the best in him. It has really nothing to do with her. So wrestling with the angel, I think there are times when we feel that split, you know, to, to take the easy road, no, 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 take the more demanding road. Do the right thing, no, do this, you know. This will have better long-range repercussions, no, but this will feel so good right now in the moment. We know how easy it is uh, with practice to ignore the voice of conscience. You know, and that's, that's really what it takes, to ignore your own conscience that's trying to guide you and support you and encourage you to do the right, spiritual, high-minded, godly thing. H how do people do that? It's just practice. They ignore that voice again and again and again. But, you know, in the Talmud, it says, the first bad habit enters our lives as an invited guest. But before long, it becomes a member of the family. <laughs> and ultimately ends up taking over the house, right? And we feel we have lost the precious part of who we are and who we want to be. So like Jacob, I think we want to climb higher on the ladder only to have a fear of heights, and, and then we want solid ground, you know? But when we're on the ground, we want to go back up the ladder. When we're on the ladder, we want to be back on the ground. So Jacob wins and loses the wrestling. You know, he's injured, he's limping, and the Bible describes him as uh, shalem, a Hebrew word 
with connotations of wholeness, integrity, and peace with himself. So Jacob has had uh, twinges of conscience. Uh, you know, uh, the bowl of stew for the birthright. Uh, he could have fed his brother. Uh, misrepresenting himself to gain a blessing uh, from his blind father. Yeah, he could have done that differently. Uh, the marriage, fatherhood, being uh, cheated himself. Uh, he starts to mature. He is strong enough to let his conscience hold its own. No. He is no longer Jacob the trickster. He is Israel, the one who struggles with God and with men. So he does not pray for a clever idea to fool Esau into forgiving him. He prays for the strength to do the right thing. And then the angel grabs him. He really seizes him. He's wounded. He's hurt, and he can survive the hurt. I think that's an interesting point, that yes, he's hurt, but he can survive it. He can pay the price of honesty and generosity, and it may hurt, and he will carry that with him. But he now believes doing the right thing is the best medicine for his troubled soul. And this is why we often say here, all we have to know is, all we have to ask ourselves, all we have to ask the presence of spirit within us is, what's the next right thing for me to do? Just the next right thing. I just need to know the next right thing. So you know, Jacob's old way of getting what he wanted at any cost was a conflict with his wanting to be a good person, right? I want what I want, but I want to be this spiritually conscious, God-guided and directed person. But I want what I want. But if I do this, am I going to get what I want? Well, we say, yes, this is actually the way to have more of what you want in your life by showing up as your best, most spiritual, conscious, loving self. We might be able to ignore the voice of God in us, but only temporarily. You know. So I would ask you this morning to think about, is there a place in your life where you are wrestling with an angel. Remember, an angel, metaphysically, is a thought, an idea of God. Is there some idea that God has dropped into you and you're wrestling with it? Oh, no, not me. Who, me now at this point in my life? Are you kidding me? You clearly meant that for somebody else, maybe the people next door, but not me. I wonder if that's happening because I notice myself again and again how God will drop in an idea and I start to wrestle with it all the reasons why it can't happen, why it's going to be difficult. Where are we going to get the money? Who's going to do that? Blah, 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 blah. Someplace where you're radiant, someplace in your life right now, I believe your radiant higher self wants to assert itself over your lower self. Yeah. In A Course in Miracles, it says that our ego speaks first and speaks loudest. Right? So we're not here to hide our light under a bushel. I believe we are here to give expression to our most radiant self. And part of how we do that is that we go for God first, and everything else, all, everything on our, on our wish list, everything that we're wanting, that will all be added. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment now to become still and reflect on this, that God is, in fact, right where we are. The fullness, the allness of God is present in each and every one of us. We are surrounded and filled with God's light and love and wholeness and intelligence. We are also all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And so in this awareness, I claim for each and every one of us that where we are tempted to not be our best self, whether it's at security, at the airport, or anywhere else in life, I claim for each and every one of us that, no, we hold back there and we call forth that very best within us to be an expression, that which is most loving and compassionate and kind and good, because I know that's the truth of who each and every one of us is. And all that other stuff, we let it go. We let it fall away. We include in our prayer today our family members, our parents and children, everybody we hold near and dear. And we say right where they are, God is fully present as healing, as love, as all needs met, as peace. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So everything that's been pulling at our attention, including the appearance of earthquakes, we claim God's perfect peace for everyone affected everywhere. We bless our church, we bless all churches. 
synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are blessed by being together, that coming together in consciousness today, there's raising up for us, there's healing, there's a greater good. And we allow ourselves to be open, willing vessels for spirit's expression. We say yes to it. So with a full heart, I release this word. I know it's done, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.